Hello. All right. <clears throat> Welcome. Uh, it's good to be talking to you today. Uh, today I want to talk about some technologies that uh, we've been developing that allow the brain uh, circuitry to be mapped and also to be controlled. And the impacts of these kinds of technologies, um, and you've heard about some of the kinds of applications that people can pursue with this in the previous talks, um, are that we can try to decipher the incredible density, heterogeneity, and high speed of operation of brain circuitry. So our group is an engineering group. We take a very specific approach. Um, and the neuroengineering discipline that we follow is to think backwards from the physical complexity of the brain, and then try to figure out what principles, scientific principles, exist that tell us how to go about analyzing and engineering the brain. For example, what is the nature of the cell types of the brain? What is the nature of the connections between neurons in the brain? And what kinds of handles can we use to control and read out the electrical activity of the brain? Then, we survey the fields of engineering in order to try to figure out uh, whether materials or proteins or devices or robots, we can actually then go forward and try to build technologies that can help neuroscientists solve basic or clinical neuroscience problems. So today, I want to tell you about nine short stories. Um, many of these are new and unpublished bits of work uh, that we are um, excited about. And the first set of tools I want to talk about are the optogenetic tools. These are technologies that let you take neurons, install photosensitive proteins that convert light into electrical energy of some kind, and then by aiming light at a certain set of cells, you can activate them or silence them. Then, of course, you can put optical fibers into the living brain. The brain doesn't feel pain, so you can install these optical devices in the brain and then activate sets of neurons or silence sets of neurons. In the wild, three different major classes of molecules have been discovered over the last half century by biophysicists, ecologists, and cell biologists who are interested in figuring out how cells photosynthesize and sense light. The first class of such molecules was found almost a half century ago. And this is the bacteri bacterial redoxins. These are light-driven proton pumps that exist in archaea, single-cell prokaryotes. And these molecules are seven transmembrane proteins that contain an all-transretinal as the chromophore, the light-absorbing molecule. And when hit by light, it'll translocate a proton from one side of the membrane to the other. So if you look uh, into salty water, such as you might find in the San Francisco Bay or the Great Salt Lake in Utah or in the Dead Sea, you can actually see organisms that are highly colored membranes. And when um, these organisms uh, sense light, they actually can convert that light into stored energy. A second class of such molecules, also seven transmembrane proteins that have an all transretinal within them, are the halorhodopsins. And these were discovered about a decade later. These molecules are light-driven chloride pumps. They convert light into uh, the transport of chloride from one side of the membrane to the other, and that also allows you to store electrical energy in the cell that then gets transformed into chemical energy downstream. Finally, around 10 years ago, several molecules, light-driven ion channels, were found, and these molecules sense light, but then convert them into a dissipation of, of cation gradient. These are the channel adoptions, light-driven cation channels that pass primarily protons and sodium, but to a lesser extent, calcium and potassium. And unlike the first two, which are pumps, these are channels. So they cannot be used to store energy, but they are instead used by single-celled algae to sense light and then navigate towards safe, effective levels of light for photosynthesis. All three of these classes of molecules have known crystal structures for at least some of the members of the class. And um, what we've been doing over the last decade or so is finding that each of these classes of molecule, the light-driven proton pumps, the light-driven chloride pumps, and the light-driven cation channels from left to right, can be used in neurons. There are a couple of reasons why. First of all, these molecules have very high-speed temporal responses. Upon illumination, they actually achieve their ion transport within microseconds to milliseconds. Now, not all of these molecules express in neurons. We've had to screen through uh, different molecules from the wild to find ones that are safe, effective, and function in neurons. They have to have the right speed and magnitude of current in order to function. So on the left, we found in a paper that we published in 2010 
that one of the member of the light-driven proton pump family, the arcuridopsin, could be virally delivered to neurons in the live mouse brain. And then you could illuminate those neurons with a yellow or green laser and accomplish neural silencing. We call this molecule ARCH. In the middle column, um, in 2007, we published a paper where we took a light-driven chloride pump, a halorodopsin, put it into neurons and showed that we could quiet down neurons with yellow or orangish light. The currents, though, were small, which is why we went on to find uh, ARCH. And then the third column are the channelodopsins, the light-driven cation channels. Those are actually the first to be put into neurons in 2005. Um, and uh, by expressing these molecules in neurons, we showed that we could, with millisecond timescale blue light pulses, excite neurons with pulses of, of blue light and cause them to fire action potentials. One of the nice things about these molecules is that the all-trans retinol, the vitamin A derivative that they use to um, uh, sense light, is found endogenously in the mammalian body. So this was sort of a coincident finding, first I think reported by Yalo's group, that channelodopsins will function in intact brain tissue for mammals. You don't have to add any chemicals. So the search for these molecules really began in 1999 to 2000. There is a paper from a group in Japan here shown where they showed that electric current, plotted versus chloride, uh, for the halorodopsins was actually not optimal for brain function because the proteins would function best at very high chloride levels, like 5 molar chloride. And the brain, of course, um, as, has, you know, uh, in the 100 millimolar chloride range. On the right-hand side, though, you can see that this paper showed that there was one of these molecules, the halorodopsin from the species of Archaea and Feronis, which had its peak function exactly in the mammalian chloride concentration range. And so that was the reason why we took this molecule, put into neurons, and showed that we could quiet down neuroactivity. Now, this molecule was not very strong. It didn't function very well in neurons. And so it actually, I think there's only one paper where people have used this original Enferonis halorodopsin to change the behavior of a mammal. And this was done by Yamanaka's group. They put this molecule into the hypercretin or orexin expressing neurons in the hypothalamus of mice by engineering them transgenically. And they then implanted an optical fiber to silence these neurons. These neurons are, of course, the neurons that are compromised in patients with narcolepsy. And when they illuminate those cells, what you see is that the neurons will be silenced. And what happens then, as you can see plotted in the top graph, is that the probability of wakefulness goes down to zero within about half a minute. All the animals fall asleep within tens of seconds. And then after the light is off, they wake back up again. Now, because these molecules are not very strong, we went out into the wild and tried to find out what kinds of molecules we could um, obtain that were better. And uh, uh, Brian Chow and Shira Han, now assistant professors at UPenn and BU, respectively, found some molecules um, that were much more strong. One of them, that, this is the ARCH molecule, was a light-driven outward proton pump. And as you can see on the left, lower left, these molecules had much higher photocurrents uh, at, at both low light powers and high light powers. And on the right, you can see that the neurons can be shut down with light in the awake behaving mouse brain. In the years since, we've continued to look for molecules from different species. And we have now surveyed literally over a thousand genomes for molecules with different functions. And I want to tell you about some of these now, including some new unpublished data. One insight is that if you search locally in genomic space, that is, you look for molecules from species, that are related to the species of a molecule that you already like, that could be a powerful search strategy. So the molecule we found ARCH from, Halorobum pseudomense, um, has many relatives. And we found a molecule ARCH-T uh, that was found in a related species. And ARCH-T was effectively 3.5 times more light sensitive than ARCH. And so we published this a couple years later. And this was the molecule that enabled, perhaps due to its light sensitivity, the first optogenetic control of a primate neuron with neural silencing that could change a primate behavior in work done in Bob Woods' group at NIH. In addition to searching locally in genomic space, you can search broadly in genomic space. For example, the halorodopsins are, as a rule, driven by yellow to orange light and have much less excitation in the blue. Leonid Brown, several years ago, had found that funguses, actually, also have light-sensitive proton pumps. And um, we took one of those that he had discovered, the Leptospheria maculans opsin, which we nicknamed MAC, and it's more blue light sensitive. 
So by putting a Hilbert opsin in one set of neurons and the MEP opsin or, uh, into a second set of neurons, we could differentially silence them with red versus blue light, enabling multiplex control of multiple neural populations. That's useful if, for example, you want to shut down one set of neurons and then briefly afterwards shut down a second set of neurons and see how those two sets of neurons might be working together to impact a downstream target. So that catches up to the published work on silencers. And I want to tell you about an unpublished story, uh, which is about a new set of silencers. There's another reason to seek different colors of light, uh, because we want to um, uh, use red light to silence neurons, because red light can go deeper into the brain. So in some modeling work, as well as, as, well as experimental work done by Leah Acker and Mike Henninger in our group, uh, both through modeling and measurement, we have shown that red light can go far deeper into the brain than, than green light, for example. Um, and in fact, if you look on the right-hand side, you can imagine that red light can, with appreciable efficiency, get almost all the way through the entire mouse brain. So Amy Tron and our group has been leading an effort to find new, and engineer new molecules that are red-shifted and more powerful so that we can do red light neural silencing or non-invasive optogenetics. This is important for several reasons. First of all, non-invasiveness is very important for many studies of neural pathology. And also in some fields like neural development, implanting an optical fiber is not practical because the brain is going to physically change size. And if you have a fiber implanted and the brain is changing its volume, the fiber might cause a lesion. So Amy uh, found and engineered a new molecule that we named JAWS, which is redshifted and also much stronger than earlier optogenetic tools. For the aficionados, this is how we found and made JAWS. We first screened through genomes that we have, had hypothesized would contain redshifted molecules due to a chance observation we had made in an earlier paper. In the middle panel, we then found two point mutations that vastly increased the photocurrent. And then on the right-hand side, we added some trafficking sequences that did not increase photocurrent, but made the expression more clean. If we compare JAWS to other halorodopsins, and the ENPHR 3.0 is a, um, a expression-boosted halorodopsin from Gardenaro and Dysroth, uh, what you can see in the middle plot is that the percent inhibition with JAWS with red light is far better than with uh, an earlier halorodopsin. So even with modest red light powers, we can silence neurons expressing JAWS. These are virally delivered to the mouse brain um, and then illuminated with a local optical fiber. And with uh, even with the brightest red light delivered, the ENPHR 3.0, the enhanced trafficking earlier halorodopsin, was unable to mediate strong neural silencing. Jess Carden's group at Yale University uh, was interested in the following question. Many silencers are studied for their impact in silencing spontaneous neural activity, but many neuroscientists care about stimulus evoked or behaviorally associated basic neural activity. Um, in fact, perhaps most neuroscientists focus on that. So her group took JAWS expressed it in the visual cortex neurons in the mouse, and then showed these mice drifting visual stimuli, like gratings, um, and then tried to figure out whether they could silence these stimulus evoked responses. As you can see here, earlier halorodopsins could only silence perhaps one half to two thirds of the stimulus evoked neural activity of visual cortex neurons. The archreodopsins, Arch and Arch-T, could do better, but JAWS um, was as good as the best um, and was the strongest halorodopsin by far. <clears throat> now, on to non-invasive neural silencing. We virally expressed halorodopsin, JAWS, in deep cortical targets and then put an optical fiber on top of the skull of awake behaving mice and showed that we could actually silence neurons many millimeters deep through the skull in awake behaving mice. So this fulfills the goal of achieving um, a minimally invasive strategy for uh, uh, silencing neurons in the, the brain. Future directions could include shifting these even further out to the infrared and also looking for, um, which might be of importance for the developmental neuroscientists, completely non-invasively illum illuminating the brain through the skin even so that no surgery of any kind is required. Now I'd like to talk about activators. So whereas optogenetic silencers let you delete neurons temporarily, to assess their necessity in generating behavior or pathology. Optogenetic activators let you play back neural activity to the brain and can be used to assess the sufficiency of neural activity 
to initiate a behavior or pathological state. In 2003, Nagel, Hegemann, and Bomberg had reported the discovery of channel rhodopsin 2, this light-gated cation channel I mentioned earlier. They also commented that such molecules could be used to um, change calcium concentration or to polarize the cell membrane. So around 2004, um, Carl Dysroth and I decided to try this out. And um, uh, working in my grad school lab, or Dick Chen's group, I gave this a spin and actually found out on the first try, so this was very serendipitous, that we could express these in neurons and then use blue light pulses to excite neural activity. And so that's actually, I think, the very first cell that I recorded, and you can use blue light pulses to excite neural activity. In this paper that we published in 2005, we showed that varying kinds of pulse sequences of light could elicit complex patterns uh, of timing of action potentials. And also, if you drive excitatory or inhibitory neurons, you can cause the synaptic release of neurotransmitter. In the time since, many groups have been working on um, augmenting these molecules. Um, and uh, many groups have, for example, shown point mutations that can, for example, increase the current, the H134R point mutation of chalidopsin 2. In the middle of the slide, you can see that some of the molecules can be used to speed up, uh, some of these mutations can be used to speed up the protein function. That is, you can have faster action potentials. Um, but one of the problems, although the font seems to be a little bit overlaid on this version of the, of the slide, uh, is that uh, speeding up the molecule does result in making the molecule less light sensitive. And similarly, you can increase the light sensitivity of the molecule with the C128 or D156 mutations, but this has the effect of slowing down the molecule. In effect, speeding up the molecule closes the molecule faster uh, after light um, turns off, and that has the effect of also reducing the number of ions per photon that go through. So um, that's one idea why speed and light sensitivity were thought to be inversely related. Finally, at the bottom, people have been trying to redshift channel adopsins as well. And people have made, through chimerogenesis and genome mining, green light activated channel adopsins, but nobody up till now has made one that has a peak in the yellow or is highly driven by red light. <clears throat> so, in a paper we just published in Nature Methods last month, we collaborated with Gain Wong um, and the Beijing Genomics Institute to mine over 120 species of algae to identify over 60 new channel adoptions in a quest to see if we could solve these problems. Could we find a true red light activated channel adoption, which can be activated with brief pulses of light? Can we also find molecules that are both fast and light sensitive? And this is work that was then led by Nathan Klopetke, currently a postdoc in the group. <coughs> the screen uh, yielded 61 new channel adoptions. Those were plotted on the homology phylogeny tree on the left. And on the right are the outcomes of the screen for the most interesting channel adoptions. On the top, you can see we were delivering red light to neurons. And we found one molecule, um, which we nicknamed crimson, which could be driven by red light. And then as you can see in the lower two bar graphs, there are green and blue light excitable channel adopsins, many of which have much higher performance uh, in terms of photocurrent than earlier molecules. This is the action spectrum, that is how much charge you transport versus color for crimson, the new red light driven channel adopsin, and earlier molecules, including the green light drivable ones that were generated by several other groups earlier. So crimson has a peak around almost 600 nanometers. And as you can see, with red laser light, say, from a 633 nanometer laser, you can have effect efficacies that are between 50 to 80 percent in terms of photocurrent uh, that you can achieve. OK. <clears throat> so now, with crimson, you can excite neural activity with good time resolution and modest light power in the red. We found a point mutation of crimson, crimson R, that also makes the kinetics um, as high speed as some of the earlier molecules, like the H134R mutant of chenorhodopsin 2. And so you can get out almost to the infrared. We're using 735 nanometer light in this bottom plot and work that we did in collaboration with Martha Constantine Patton's group 
to excite neural activity. And you can see in the lower right hand corner, spike probability versus pulse width, um, with 735 nanometer light of modest light power, um, if you have pulse widths in the 20 to 40 millisecond range, you can actually have almost perfect spike probability of, less, of elicitation. So we're excited to go further and see whether truly infrared light can be used with crimson as well. Um, and there's obviously a lot more that we could do uh, in terms of mutagenesis in order to shift that out even further. Let me give you an example of the kinds of things you can do with crimson in addition to red light activation, which as we've already talked about is of interest in the mammalian brain. <coughs> Uh, this is work that was led by Vivek Jayarman's group at Janelia Farm. And he had pointed out to us that in Drosophila, one of the major model organisms of neuroscience and biology, it's been difficult to get good optogenetic control because of behavioral artifacts that are elicited by visible light. In the, in the right-hand bar graph, you can see star responses. That is, the flies will flail their arms and show other kinds of behaviors with just regular light, no optogenetic tools. But if you look in the, at the final bar, if you go into the red, 720 nanometers, then the star response can be greatly reduced if the animals are also Hi, everybody. So um, um, shall we continue the, the talk? OK, great. So to summarize, the chronos molecule is uh, not only very light sensitive, but very high speed, and that is um, makes Kronos perhaps a good general use chenodopsin for controlling neural activity with great precision. <clears throat> now, Kronos and Crimson could be used together. There's a long-standing goal in optogenetics of multiplex activation. If you could activate two different sets of cells, you could imagine, uh, for example, activating a neuromodulator pathway like dopamine and then trying to activate a fast neurotransmission pathway like a glutamate pathway and seeing how the two pathways interact. You know, for example, do they reinforce each other or interact in some other way? Here you can see a brain slice expressing both chronos and crimson. And when we activate with blue light or with red light, we can get synaptic activation. Now, this does not prove, though, that we can get truly independent control. One worry is that blue light might drive crimson a little bit, and crimson is driven by red light, and red light might drive chronos. Now, it turns out, if you look at the spectrum, that red light photons that drive crimson would not drive chronos, perhaps, because the red photons are quantum mechanically too weak. But the problem, as you can see from this slide, is that all opsins are, to some extent, driven by blue light. That's because of the intrinsic retinal chromophore absorption. So one idea is, what if we use red light to drive crimson? And remember, chronos is very light sensitive, so we can use dim blue light to drive chronos, so dim that it won't engage crimson to any significant extent. As noted, light sensitive molecules up till now were reported to be slow, but with chronos, finally, it's one that is both light sensitive and fast. So serendipitously, we've done a triple optimization. We found a red shifted chenodopsin and a light sensitive fast blue chenodopsin. So, what you can see here is um, the middle uh, an attempt to try to characterize chronos and crimson spike elicitation in visual cortex brain slice with red versus blue light. And if you look at the very middle panel of this five panel figure, you can see basically neural spike probability in visual cortex brain slice of crimson expressing neurons at the top and chronos expressing neurons at the bottom with red light. As you can see, crimson expressing neurons can be fired 100% of the time with red light across this light power range, and chronos expressing neurons um, are never fired by red light. So that's sort of the easy direction, right? The red photons are just too weak. Um, in the fourth panel, though, you can see that uh, if we use blue light power, chronos expressing neurons can be driven by blue light and crimson expressing neurons are not driven by blue light uh, with perfect separation over a range of light powers that is delimited with a light blue bar. And if you do synaptic transmission, chronos expressing neurons can be perfectly driven with blue light to drive synaptic release, but never with red light. 
And crimson expressing neurons can be perfectly driven with red light, but never with blue. So that gives you um, a light power range for blue and for red, where even in intact brain tissue, you get zero crosstalk at the spiking or synaptic transmission level in intact brain tissues. So to summarize, crimson is not only a red channel option that allows you to do new kinds of experiments, for example, reduced behavioral artifact work in flies. <clears throat> Kronos is a ultra high speed, ultra light sensitive channel option that might be a good all around channel option for the future, but together they uniquely enable zero crosstalk two color control of two different sets of neural pathways in intact mammalian brain tissue. In the next phase of the talk, I want to talk about making more ion selective channel adoptions. This is new unpublished work. Young Ku Cho, a former postdoc in the group, now an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut, developed a high throughput microscopy platform that lets us rapidly go through libraries of mutants and screen for enhanced channel adoption function. <clears throat> Using this, we were able to screen literally hundreds and hundreds of point mutations. And by doing optical activation of these mutants, an optical readout of, for example, calcium sensitive dyes, we were able to find mutations that reduce the calcium flux by an order of magnitude and that reduce the proton flux by an order of magnitude. So given that calcium and protons are ions that can have multiple functions independent of their voltage control, um, we didn't name this channel option chrome, a channel option that, that omits certain ions, and therefore this might be of interest for um, you know, studies where one wants to use optogenetics but without uh, potential effects that calcium, for example, could result in, like changes in gene expression pattern, um, and so on and so forth. In the next story, I want to talk about a new project on making optogenetic tools that can actuate endogenous molecules. So far, we've talked about heterologously expressed molecules from bacteria and fungus and algae <coughs> that can be expressed in neurons to control the voltage. But what if you want to activate endogenous molecules? Daniel Schmidt, a postdoc in the group, developed a strategy to do this. We took a different photoreceptor domain, the LAV domain, shown in blue and yellow, and by tethering it to the membrane through a transmembrane domain, and by fusing it to a gene that encodes for a peptide toxin, we can make a new protein architecture that we call the lumatoxin. When you shine light on it, the light-activated uh, domain, the law of domain, acts like a light-activated hinge and opens up, moving the peptide toxin away from the ion channel or receptor that it binds to. <clears throat> and there are thousands of peptide toxins from snakes and spiders and uh, cone snails and so on. And so there's a vast repertoire of such things. So now you can imagine that we could activate this with light, move the toxin away, and actuate an endogenous channel by moving the toxin that blockades it away from it. So this works. In this slide, you can see this working with dendrotoxin, which blocks um, KV channels, potassium channels. And if you just look at the lower left-hand corner, you see an orange trace where a blue bar indicates a period of blue light delivery. And what that you, that you then see is an increase in potassium channel current that then dies away when uh, the light is turned off. And the black trace is a different channel showing that the toxin specificity is uh, retained. One power of this is that this lumatoxin optogenetic tool architecture is modular. And you can see three different, sort of three by three grid on the left. The orange uh, bar is alpha dendrotoxin, and then the next row is DTXK, and the bottom row is concatenation one. And what you can see in each of the little boxes is that each of the toxins, when embedded in the lumatoxin architecture, will enable upon elimination, actuation of a subset of the potassium channels, and the native toxin affinity is retained. On the right-hand side, you can see the actual change in the currents that you get, and as you can see, the current changes are sometimes small. So in the future, we want to make these things much bigger, and also <clears throat> to see if we can um, enhance the uh, range of molecules that can be used, and finally, also to make lumatoxins that go in the other direction. When you shine light on them, they blockade the channel, 
rather than unblockading the channel. In the next phase of the talk, I want to talk about tools we're developing for automated single cell analysis in the living mammalian brain. And this includes robots that can do neural recording and also robots that can do surgery. Over the last several years, we've been collaborating with the Craig Forrest Group at Georgia Tech uh, on a project led by Suhasa Kudandarmaya, working across our groups, on automating in vivo whole cell patch clamp. So patch clamping, of course, is a great technology. Basically, you lower a glass microneedle onto a cell and open up a little hole into the cell. <clears throat> and when you do that, you can get exquisite neural recordings with synaptic uh, event resolution. You can also inject chemicals such as fluorescent dyes into the cell to visualize the shape. And you can also harvest the contents in order to do, um, for example, transcriptomic analysis to look at cell type information at the molecular level. <clears throat> In vivo, whole cell patch clamping is difficult. Only a small number of people around the world do it. So we discovered an algorithm um, that lets you lower a pipette into the brain of a mouse and then over many consecutive steps to um, achieve uh, recordings. Um, we lower the pipette into the brain. We do a time series analysis of the pipette impedance. And that lets us to, de to detect cells with high accuracy. We then built a robot that lets us do these recordings, and that's actually being commercialized by a company that my anti-disclaimer is I have no financial link to. Um, and this company is now developing uh, kits where people can take a patch clamp system and make it automatic. <coughs> <coughs> so for example, we can do in vivo automated awake uh, mouse experiments uh, on pharmacology. Here's a collaboration with Emory Brown where we're testing out how different anesthetics affect different cell types. In the beginning, we have patch clamped a neuron and the animal is experiencing one kind of anesthetic which leads to one pattern of synaptic and subthreshold activity. Then we wake up the animal. You can see this around um, letters C and D. And then uh, you see a different pattern. And then we add a second anesthetic. From all outward appearances, the animal looks like it's anesthetized because it is, but if you look at the neural activity and the neural processes within, you can see that it almost looks like the opposite of what was happening in the beginning. So many mechanisms of brain science have been worked out in vitro, in brain slice, or in neural cultures. But until we understand how those mechanisms play roles in the awake behaving brain, um, it's hard to know just how important any one molecular or synaptic or ion channel mechanism is for a given behavior or pathology. So one hope is that we can build automated mechanism checkers that can allow you to investigate uh, which mechanisms play roles in the awake behaving brain and contribute to different diseases or therapeutic outcomes. Along those lines, we have continued to work on trying to scale up these robots so we could record from many cells at once and also to do many other kinds of manipulations like infusing drugs and so on into the brain. To achieve that, we also have been working on trying to automate other kinds of um, neuroscience skills. In vivo automation is relatively new, although arguably in vitro automation has proven transformative with, for example, the sequencing of the genome or the ability to do high throughput pharmacological screening on cell lines or synthetic biology. So we decided to try to figure out how what the, you might call in vivo robotics would do next. And so we decided to try to figure out if we could automate um, some of the steps of, of neuroscience uh, surgery. Nikita Pak a grad student in the group has been working on um, a way to lower a drill bit through the skull and trying to stop then when we get just through the skull. As you can see from these CT scans, we can actually drill through the skull and um, without human intervention, uh, get pretty much all the way through and stop without brain damage. So not only can these uh, in vivo automation uh, experiments enable sort of the democratization of neuroscience. No longer does one need to learn very, very difficult in vivo skills to do neuroscience, um, although of course the thinking is extremely important. But also, these automation strategies can lead to scalable impact. So um, if you're like me, the thought, the thought of drilling you know, a large number of holes to the skull in order to examine many different pharmacological agents in different brain regions sounds very daunting. 
But as you can see from these x-ray images of actual mouse skulls, after we used our autosurgery machine, this could not be done um, in a fully automated fashion. So to summarize, um, with in vivo robotics, we're very excited about automating some of the most difficult skills, perhaps in all of biology, but also we can then try to achieve scales of, of in vivo experimentation in awake behaving mammals that are difficult to achieve in any other way. <clears throat> the final thing I want to talk about is accessory tools. Um, making optogenetics and these other tools practical requires many strategies that enhance the function of the work. We have uh, built wireless optogenetic devices um, that can allow you to do remote control of the brain with no cables or optical fibers that might be of interest for studying development or chronic disease progression or other kinds of, of useful um, uh, studies. Um, this is being commercialized again by a lab spin out company that, again, I have no, no link to. We also have been working on a collaboration. That was work, this work was led by Christian Wentz um, and Jake Bernstein. We've also been working uh, in, with several groups, including Nancy Capel, Randy Butner, Ann Grabiel, and Chris Moore, on combining fMRI of the brain with optogenetics. And we published this, uh, a strategy that enables those two technologies to be combined. Uh, groups such as Hong Kui Zeng's group at the Allen Institute have made transgenic mice that express these optogenetic tools so that you can, um, um, without having even to use viruses, uh, use optogenetics to study the brain. And finally, uh, in work we've been doing with, in collaboration with Cliff Fonstad, Anthony Zorzos, um, a postdoc in our group now, has been developing 3D optogenetic tools that can deliver light into the brain in 3D patterns. On our website, syntheticneurobiology.org, um, there are links to many of the technologies. Um, we distribute these tools uh, freely, uh, uh, probably to well over a thousand groups at this point. We've lost track a bit because many of the distributions are handled by nonprofits such as AdGene, which is the DNA distribution, the University of North Carolina, which distributes viruses. I already mentioned the transgenics from the Allen Institute. And if you go to, um, uh, we launched a new center at MIT, the Center for Neurobiological Engineering, if you go to our website, there's a way you can actually apply um, to come by and, and uh, observe experiments for a day or so and to learn how to do these kinds of experiments. So um, there's a form there that you can fill out. And we've hosted probably about 300 groups at this point um, who have sent somebody for a day or so to, to learn neurotechnologies. On a closing note, it's interesting to think about, with all these tools, do they have a translational future? In the sense that they're in widespread use to study basic science and to study diseases in animal models, but could they be used in humans directly? So for neural control, perhaps over a quarter million people already have some kind of neural stimulation implant for electrical stimulation. and uh, in terms of the gene therapy, because of course we need to deliver an optogenetic tool to the brain with the virus, uh, there was just the first AAV approved gene therapy approved in Europe, and many trials are ongoing and uh, uh, report um, significant safety for the AAVs. So one of the questions is, well, what about the molecules themselves? These optogenetic tools come from plants and bacteria and so on. Are they safe? In 2009, in a collaboration with Bob Desimone and Ann Grabiel, uh, Shirahan led a project where we did the first primate optogenetics. Um, and we showed that we could elicit neuroactivity with optogenetics in the weight behaving non-human primates, the rhesus macaque. We also collaborated with Roderick Bronson, a pathologist, to look at um, samples of tissue. And also we looked at uh, the serum to see whether antibodies were being produced. And uh, although it was a small study, just two monkeys, um, uh, there was no overt evidence of a productive immune response, nor cell death, nor um, other things that might be wondered about, such as immune cell infiltration. In the years since, um, other groups, for example, Wim van Duffel's group, has been able to activate neurons in the non-human primate, non -human primate brain and change the behavior of the non-human primate. And as I mentioned earlier, Bob Wirtz's group has been able to shut down neurons in the non-human primate brain and alter non-human primate behavior. So it is of interest, perhaps, to think about whether, as these studies continue, 
such tools that allow you to activate or silence neurons in the brain could be used for therapeutic purposes. So to end there, this is obviously a vast collaborative project. On the left-hand side uh, are acknowledgments. I think I've mentioned all the team leaders of projects along the way, um, uh, but the, the full group is a highly interdisciplinary disciplinary group. And on the right-hand side are our collaborators in various projects. I think I've mentioned all the team leaders um, that we collaborate with on, on those projects. Um, and um, I guess we have some time for questions now. So thank you very much. All right. So the Q&A button is blinking at me. And there are some questions. Um, so one of the questions is, How do you target um, selective neurons? So one of the strategies that's uh, of, of widespread use is the fact that for many model organisms like mice, there are literally hundreds of mouse lines that express a specific enzyme, Cree recombinase, under a specific promoter. So for example, um, this person has asked about the direct versus indirect pathway neurons of the, of the striatum, for example. The direct pathway neurons will express D1 receptor, and the indirect will express a D2 receptor. So you can actually get D1 receptor Cree mice and D2 receptor Cree mice. If you put a vector, a viral vector, into the brain, um, and Scott Sternson, I think, was the first to publish the architecture that most people use nowadays, um, the flux vector, you can deliver this virus to the brain, and only in the neurons that express Cree recombinase will the virus be active. So you, uh, this has actually been done by Anatole Kreitzer, for example. I think he might have been the first to do it for direct versus indirect. They took the D1 receptor Cree mice and injected a, a virus into it, and the virus could infect multiple cell types, but um, only the D1 receptor Cree uh, expressing neurons would actually um, activate gene expression for those neurons. And this, yeah, as I mentioned, and their, their databases, like if you uh, look up GenSat, for example, they have made hundreds of Cree, Cree uh, recombinase expressing mice. And many of these are available from nonprofit institutions like Jackson Lab and others. The next question is, what are the uh, sort of kinetics of silencing and activation of neurons using optogenetics? So for activation, you can deliver, you know, one millisecond time scale pulses. And for silencing, you can shut down neurons um, for, you know, people have done up to hours. So it really is driven by your scientific question. The next question was about how optogenetic tools and in vivo recordings contribute to the goals of the Brain Initiative. So by way of background, the Obama Brain Initiative is aimed at developing new tools for mapping, recording, and controlling brain circuits, starting with model organisms like mice, but with ambitions eventually to go to humans. And uh, many of these tools are indeed um, technologies that are forming the backbone of the Brain Initiative. Um, or future versions thereof will be generated in response to the Brain Initiative uh, funding. So one of the ideas for the Brain Initiative is whether you can scale up the recordings. Uh, can you do in vivo recordings that you, where you can record thousands or millions of neurons? Um, for optogenetics, uh, there are many groups um, who are using optogenetics as part of Brain Initiative related projects. And uh, if you could, for example, activate many neurons in the brain and figure out how um, activating neurons one by one drives connected neurons that could be very useful for mapping the functional connections of the brain. The next question was, um, what time duration was uh, elapsed between the uh, beginning of the primate experiments, probably the gene delivery of the optogenetic tool, and the pathology assays? These uh, durations were not very long, just a few months. Um, so very often, of course, um, we're not uh, doing primate experiments by ourselves. There's other groups that do primate experiments because they're studying attention or cognition. And then we try to piggyback with them and uh, help them use our technologies to help them answer scientific questions. In return, we uh, try to get back some information of clinical importance. So these are not GLP, you know, GMP style experiments that, um, you know, I think would be necessary for for proving safety, let's say, at the FDA level, there's sort of projects that we're doing that piggyback on other scientific experiments. On the other hand, though, um, if that's a way of bootstrapping these experiments and galvanizing interest in them um, and to motivate others to do 
the kinds of GLP or GMP style experiments which require you know much more significant you know, commitments of time and financial investment, that's something that we are excited about. And there are some now companies uh, that are funded to do optogenetic therapies, and um, one hope is that some of these companies will take on some of this um, activity that might be not very easy to do in a, in a small academic environment. Um, next question is about opto-fMRI. Uh, the comment is that optogenetics is millisecond time scale, but fMRI has poor temporal resolution, and that's true for us too. So when we optogenetically activate a neuron, we can do that at, say, 10 pulses per second or 100 pulses per second, but the fMRI is still fMRI. So when we see the change in brain activity, of course, fMRI works through changes in blood flow. Neurons are active. Uh, and then the dominant theory right now is that neurons signal to glial cells, and glial cells regulate the vasculature, and then that changes the blood flow, um, and that's what you measure with fMRI. And so the hemodynamic response functions for fMRI are pretty much identical to the hemodynamic response functions for regular fMRI. So we're talking about time constants in, you know, the seconds to tens of seconds, and um, all of the caveats that accompany that. On the other hand, you can imagine the use of optofMRI uh, in the following fashion. Maybe you use optofMRI to map the entire brain so you can figure out what regions a given cell type in a given brain region can engage. Then you can go in with electrodes, um, maybe such as the auto patch device, and try to do then extremely high speed, extremely high fidelity recordings, um, and in a way that fMRI cannot. So one idea is that optofMRI opto can be useful for a couple things. One is for analyzing fMRI itself, so we could try to interpret human brain scanning, where fMRI is one of the only games in town. The other is to use it to do preliminary mapping of brain circuits for later follow-on studies, <coughs> which uh, would use a higher resolution neural um, monitoring technology, such as patch clamp, electrode recording, calcium imaging, or so on. So I'm going to sip some water here. These are all great questions. Okay. The next question was, um, what was the web page which was about applying to come to visit? Um, so uh, I co-direct a new center at MIT called the Center for Neurobiological Engineering. We have 24 faculty um, who are the initial members of the center. And one of the core activities of the center is to facilitate the teaching of neurotechnology. So we've started, um, uh, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold here, um, what we call the Neurotechnology Training Program. And the website uh, where you can download a PDF and fill it out and then email it to our administrator um, is web.mit.edu slash CNBE, which stands for Center for Neurobiological Engineering. There's a link on the top of the page called Sharing. And you can then click on a link there um, to uh, apply for, I guess, what we now call the Neurotechnology Exchange. We used to call it the Neurotechnology Training Program. And uh, fill that out. Uh, we want to make sure that people have enough background um, uh, knowledge so that the training is not... Um, uh, you know, so, so over the person's head that it's sort of meaningless. You know, we, we can't train people on basic uh, mouse handling or other very, very basic neuroscience skills. So if somebody wants to come in and learn, for example, in vivo optogenetics or in vivo um, auto patching or other skills, we want to make sure that, that um, they know the basics, that we can teach them our technology, but we don't have the bandwidth or resources to teach sort of fundamental things like how to pick up a mouse or how to you know, do very basic things like inject a drug or, um, you know, sort of uh, um, that kind of thing. Uh, but we've, I think we've accommodated pretty much all reasonable requests that we've gotten over the years. And again, members of over 300 groups have, have come out to, to visit. All right. Next question. How do you identify all the cell types in the human brain? Yeah, this is a very hard question. But it's an interesting one because... The cell types of the brain um, are not well-defined. We currently, we meaning neuroscientists, sort of anecdotally define cell types by their shape or by one or a few proteins they express, or some even by the firing patterns. So I think one of the big questions first is how do you even know when you found a cell type? Is the gene expression pattern enough, or do you need, do you need the morphology, or do you also need to know the physiological roles in the brain? 
Also, are cell types static? Do they change um, over time? We know that many genes in the genome, for example, are regulated by circadian rhythm. So one question might be, are cell types static or not? You can imagine a scenario where you start out with two cell types and their gene expression patterns change over the course of a day uh, to the point where at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they are now the same cell type and then they diverge. I, I don't know of any evidence for that, but I just want to point out how complex a question this is. So um, one strategy, of course, and this is another brain initiative focus, is to develop tools that would allow the mapping of the cell types of the brain. And probably we need the gene expression patterns and the shapes and the physiological recordings. So one of our projects, actually, and we're expanding this into many different directions now, is to take strategies like our single cell analysis robots and enable individual groups to do their own cell type mapping. Because cell types might also, also vary as a function of disease or age or plasticity. <clears throat> All right, we're almost out of time, but there's a couple more questions and I think we can get to them. The next question is about, does this technology help address the substrates of consciousness? Uh, this question might be, be beyond my pay grade, but um, uh, I think we need to have a good definition of consciousness so that we know when we've actually found what we're looking for. I do think that we need a lot of technologies if we ever want to get to the point where we can, for example, hope to mechanistically address questions like consciousness. So um, if we could, for example, record neural activities and see that certain patterns are correlated with consciousness, what Christoph Koch and Francis Crick called the neural correlates of consciousness, or NCCs, that's one area that could help. Another very interesting possibility is that if we can stimulate neurons in complex patterns and see that those can drive various kinds of downstream sensations or decisions, that could help as well. But those, I think, are, are questions that, that are just beginning barely to be asked, one could argue. Um, and in part, I think understanding what consciousness is at a, at a definitional level is something that is, is even by itself challenging. How do we know when we found it, right? That said, many people are using these technologies to study properties that everybody, I think, agrees are helpful and contribute to consciousness, like awareness and attention and being awake versus being asleep. Um, and so already optogenetics and these other tools are being used widely to try to address those building blocks that we, I, I think everybody thinks is important for consciousness, but probably aren't the whole thing. <clears throat> okay, next question. How long until genetically encoded optical neural activity indicators are from being used practically? Yeah, so there are many groups working on genetically encoded fluorescent reporters of neural activity. You know, so our tools allow you to control neural activity with light. Another direction is to record neural activity through light emission from cells. And people have tried both bioluminescence, where neurons sort of blink at you when they are active, as well as fluorescence, where you deliver light to the brain, and then the neurons will emit a different wavelength of light than the incident light. This field is, I think, experiencing a bit of a renaissance right now. For example, last year, um, a group at Genelia Farm published a paper reporting a genetically encoded uh, fluorescent reporter of neural activity, a calcium reporter called GCAMP6. And this molecule was sensitive enough that they were able to map neural activity at different points along a dendritic branch of a single neuron in the intact brain. So I thought that was pretty cool. They even showed, for example, that you might have a neuron whose spiking output was, let's say, non-selective, but different parts of the neuro neural dendritic tree could be selective for different kinds of things, and the neuron then sums all those things together and they kind of cancel out. So that's something, of course, that you could never do with a tetrode, let's say, or some other kind of non-invasive electrical recording um, uh, methodology. So, <clears throat> so I do think that we are seeing um, an acceleration. You know, the first genetically encoded calcium reporters were published almost two, dec two decades ago um, with Atsushi Miyawaki and, and Roger Chen, for example. Um, and now I think we're finally seeing examples where they are being used to answer questions that you cannot answer using other technologies. So that's very exciting. <clears throat> All right. 
The next question on the list is, do you take in consideration the pH level of the brain fluid when, do, when doing your research? Great question. So Komatsui just published a paper in Neuron a couple, couple weeks ago. They expressed chenodopsins in glial cells. And what they show is that when you activate chenodopsin in glia, you actually get pH changes. And glia are pH sensors. And so the glia actually release transmitters in response to pH changes mediated by chenodopsins. So I like this paper because it shows that these molecules don't just control electricity in some anonymous and uncharacterizable fashion, but, you know, it's ions, right? Ions actually implement electrical changes. They went on to show that archaeodopsins, the light-driven proton pumps that we talked about earlier, if you put them into glia, they ship protons the opposite way. And they actually showed that this could exert a neuroprotective effect. So they had a, um, in a, in a mouse model, a way of getting brain damage. Um, and then what they showed was that if you optogenetically inhibit neuron, uh, the glial cells with ARCH, the brain damage is prevented. And so that was sort of the pièce de résistance of their paper, that optogenetic tools can, be, um, can have ion-specific effects, and they could have sometimes very complex downstream um, changes. So I recommend that paper highly to everybody um, for many reasons. It's a, a non-voltage use of optogenetics. It's a use of optogenetics in glia, which is very interesting. But also, they show how the downstream effects of an optogenetic manipulation can have um, you know, very interesting uh, uh, signaling properties um, that can have bold consequences in our analysis of the brain. So that's all the questions on the docket. I guess I'll turn the conversation back over to the hosts. And I thank you for your time.